Climate change, of course, is an established fact, but it's not one that necessarily unifies us, even those of us most directly affected. One of my students, Peter Rudiak Gould, went to conduct fieldwork in the low-lying Marshall Islands, a region particularly vulnerable to rising sea levels. There he found plenty of evidence of beaches, trees, even an ancient cemetery falling into the sea. But he also found plenty of locals happy to say it's not a problem. They even cited a biblical passage in which God promised Noah never again to flood the earth. Scientists, of course, deal in boring old facts, but they're not terribly united. In fact, they spend a lot of their time squabbling with one another, competing for resources like grant money and whatnot. By contrast, it's almost a hallmark feature of groups that sign up to counterfactual beliefs that they're highly unified. Let me give you one example. A Gallup poll in 2010 showed that 40% of Americans uh, believed that human beings in their current form were created by God 10,000 years ago. People who sign up to beliefs like that tend to form part of groups that dance together and sing together and perform rituals and are highly unified. In Papua New Guinea, many people in the face of colonial incursion concluded that Western goods are not the product of some kind of secular production process, but the creations of otherworldly beings, of gods. And the way to gain access to those goods is by performing rituals, or in some cases, building landing strips. Again, an example of a counterfactual belief system that was highly unifying. In fact, cargo cults are often described and upheld as one of the best examples of the first emergence of Melanesian nationalism. If counterfactual beliefs, like the denial of climate change, the denial of evolution, the denial of where technology comes from, are the things that unify us as human beings, then we really need to understand the psychology involved. My colleagues and I have been studying this problem for quite a number of years, and I'm tempted to share with you the many interesting facts this has generated. But our experience is that's not going to get us on the same page very quickly. So instead, I'm going to tell you a bit of a story about my trials and tribulations as an anthropologist, and I'm going to slip a few facts in along the way. My story begins here in Papua New Guinea, where I went to live for two years among a group that formed part of one of the country's longest lasting and largest cargo cults. These are some of the senior men in my village. They're forming a solemn procession into a specially constructed temple where they will lay out offerings to the ancestors and perform other kinds of rituals. It's said that the ancestors of the group, so the dead relatives of the people you see in this photograph, will soon return from the dead bearing all the wonders of Western technology. They'll flatten the rainforest and produce magically overnight a vast city of high-rise buildings, the like of which people had only ever heard stories about. Before this could happen, however, the ancestors needed to be convinced that the living were ready for this miracle to occur. Uh, it said that the ancestors, though invisible, are all around at any given moment, keeping a very close watch on people's comings and goings. They're gratified when people perform the correct rituals of the tradition and offended uh, when they uh, transgress against the, the norms and rules and morals of the, of the thing. Now, one other thing I should say is that these ancestors, when they return, are expected to take the form of ethnically European people. So when I, a young white man, turned up saying I wanted to follow people around, keeping detailed notes on everything people were doing, that this was greeted with a certain amount of excitement and over-interpretation. During the two years that I lived in this uh, community, I was privileged to be able to observe a very wide variety of their um, practices and learn about their belief system. They had a great many frequent daily, weekly rituals that united a vast movement. Also during my stay, I came to observe the uh, development of a whole set of new rituals that were very intense emotionally and had never been performed before. They included uh, very euphoric things like dancing and singing and a mass marriage and things of that kind. But they also involved some very dysphoric, very unpleasant rituals. And these seemed to be especially bonding for people. Eventually, uh, as they waited for their ancestors to return and consumed through large feasts all of their livestock and garden produce, they ended up facing the specter of starvation and had to go back to their ordinary lives and rebuild their shattered economy. Now, you might think that the failure of prophecy here would have dented enthusiasm for the cult, but not at all. This cult has been going for more than 50 years. It's as strong today as it's ever been. 
And in fact, nobody's enthusiasm was at all dented by this experience of the failure of prophecy. In fact, if anything, people were more tightly bonded together than ever before. Now, I wanted to then see the extent to which some of these things I'd observed in Papua New Guinea generalized to other cultural groups. So my colleagues and I began to uh, gather together a huge amount of information about the world's rituals extracted from an amazing resource called the Human Relations Area Files, which is a vast storehouse of ethnographic writings. I did say I was going to slip in a few facts. Um, here's an example. What we found is that if you analyse the rituals of the world, they do fall into the kinds of categories that I observed in Papua New Guinea. There's a sort of inverse correlation between frequency and emotional arousals. And in fact, a real clustering of rituals around the high frequency, but rather boring end of the continuum, rather like the laying out of offerings to the ancestors in those temples that unite large populations. And a clustering of rituals around the lower frequency, but more intense end of the spectrum that are much more bonding. This all seemed to confirm our hypotheses. But we also learned something that really surprised us, that as rituals become more frequent, uh, agricultural intensity increases. In other words, as societies become more reliant on farming, as they become larger and more complex, the rituals become more frequent, and rather less intense emotionally, and the really rare intense rituals, like the ones of the splinter group that I described, uh, become less common. In fact, they're often perceived as a threat in larger societies to the unity of the state or the nation or what have you. Now, to test these theories, to see whether they really tell us about the way ritual and social complexity and group size, etc., evolve, we constructed a really large database of global historical materials called Seishat, named after the ancient Egyptian goddess of writing. This is a really ambitious endeavor. We have already 150,000 complex data points in the, in the uh, data bank. And it'll enable us to test a wide variety of theories about the uh, nature and origins of social complexity. But it'll also, crucially, allow us to be able to make predictions about global trends in ways that we think will be of great value to policymakers. We also test some of these theories experimentally. So the idea that intense emotional experiences are especially bonding for the group is something that we've been studying for a long time. And our evidence does suggest that dysphoric experiences are the most bonding of all. One of the reasons we think this is the case is that dysphoric experiences prompt a great deal of reflection. And that is used to build the sense of the personal self, the stuff that makes you you and that makes me me. And when you share those sorts of things with a group, it's incredibly bonding. We've been studying the psychology of these sorts of patterns of group bonding among tribal warriors, victims of terrorist atrocities, religious groups, even football fans. And actually it turns out that if your football team loses regularly and you suffer a lot as a consequence, you're much more bonded than if your team cons consistently wins. So you should join the bad teams, really. This also helps us to understand certain otherwise very puzzling religious doctrines. Why have a religion which a god sends his only son to be horribly tortured and killed for a sin that occurred many uh, generations before he was born, or any of them at the time? It sort of makes no sense in terms of factuality, but in terms of the psychology involved, it makes perfect sense. This is an incredibly uh, intensely bonding doctrine for Christians, both with one another and with their Messiah figure. And I think this is also the spirit in which we need to understand these cargo cults. They're not fundamentally about the facts of where technology comes from. They're about the shared dysphoric experience of colonized peoples, indigenous peoples, in the face of oppressive colonial regimes, and their efforts to unify themselves in response to that. So facts don't unite us, but rituals and shared experiences and emotions do. An interesting feature of this is it doesn't seem to matter uh, whether they, these things are actually shared. What matters is the conviction of sharedness. And this actually may have some important policy implications. Violent groups are very often united, unified, by the conviction of shared dysphoric experience. So the idea that other members of your group share your sufferings. But what if we could develop interventions that challenge those shared 
uh, assumptions, those convictions in the sharedness of the dysphoria. My colleagues and I, as part of a European Research Council grant, are attempting to do exactly that. And if we're successful, this may actually be one of those occasions where uh, it may not actually be such a bad thing that facts don't unify us. Thank you.